This is Stanford, one of the most prestigious universities of the world. On staff, 17 Nobel laureates and many other well-known scientists. What is known to the world as the Silicon Valley started at the university's industrial park. Now the world is beginning to pay attention to biodiversity and ecosystem services and the research of another Stanford scientist, Harold Mooney, this year's laureate of the Volvo Environment Prize. Well, we like to classify ecosystem services as provisioning services. That's the ones that people know about most, the food and lumber and resources that are in the global marketplace. But then there are a class of services called regulating services. And they're not on the marketplace, but they're crucial to society. And that disease control, weather control, climate control, which are not on the marketplace, but yet are, are vital to the survival, clean water and so forth. Then there's another class of services, called cultural services. They relate to values which aren't economic in nature, and the spiritual values and, and recreation and, and the beauty of, of nature. Putting a value, not necessarily a price, but valuing e ecosystem services is crucial to our conserving them. Making people understand they get benefits, value from services is crucial. Thoughts on how we'd actually go about valuing ecosystems and ecosystem services were the best of anyone on the entire committee. It tries to put it directly into human well-being, how human yeah. well-being... He's one of the few professors I know that will actually seek out students and say, I want to hear what's going on with your life and with your research, and that definitely exemplifies who Hal is. There are a lot of very smart people here, but there are very few smart people as graceful and kind as he is. It, it sort of flows very easily between the scientific and the policy communities, um, and I think very few people can do that. If you meet him, he's very self-effacing. He's very, very modest. He has a great sense of humor. If you find him in any given morning, whether it's raining or, or sun shining, he's on his bike with his helmet on, pedaling faithfully to, to work. And if he's not doing that, then he's flying all over the world, motivating people, inspiring people. He's just a wonderful colleague, a true inspiration, and really well deserving of this award. Harold Mooney started his career as a field biologist, studying vegetation at high altitudes. I originally started working in the mountains of California, up in the White Mountains, which go to 14,000 feet elevation and looking at why we're pl did certain plants go to a certain elevation and stop and other plants take over. One of the inventions by Harold Mooney and his colleagues was a mobile laboratory used to study plants in Death Valley, the hottest place on Earth. And that was to ask the question, if a given climate exists in the world, will plants and ecosystems evolve to look alike if the climate is the same in different parts of the world? And so we started study comparative studies here at Jasper Ridge, the chaparral, and with Chile, which has exactly the same climate, but the plants have evolved independently. They weren't related in any way. And looking at them, had they evolved comparable mechanisms to adapt to these comparable climates? And yes, they did. And so we, we, we established that. The usual thinking for you know, ecologists has been uh, how the environment affects biodiversity. His question then was how biodiversity actually plays a role on the functioning and processes of the environment. That idea was reviewed in that famous global biodiversity assessment and that was the question that he brought to the forum and he you know, coordinated hundreds of scientists to produce this amazing assessment of the global state of biodiversity from the point of view of how biodiversity affects ecosystem processes. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was called for by the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan and initiated in 2001. More than 1,300 researchers were involved in the project. The objective was to assess the consequences of ecosystem change for human well-being. Part of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which took five years to produce, it looked at the ecosystems around the world and it looked at their capacity to deliver services to society and 60% of the services were being degraded. So we've lost a lot. We've lost uh, resources. We've lost natural capital. And uh, the wealth of nations is being degraded. 
Millennium Ecosystem Assessment really helped us to understand the state of the world's natural capital. It helped us to realize that elements of the environment that we have long taken for granted are disappearing beneath our noses. And I think especially when we look at a world with seven billion humans going toward nine billion, we need to recognize that continuing to use these services as if they were free really isn't going to allow them to be used sustainably. Thinking of them as having a price, either really or at least conceptually, is a very powerful way to help people understand the value that we're extracting from nature. Harold Mooney has been active in the foundation of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Proponents believe it can play the same role for biodiversity as the UN Climate Panel, the IPCC, has played in that field, taking analysis of relevant science directly to policymakers. Well, the main thing is to crack how we're doing in the preservation and conservation of ecosystem services. Divide that knowledge. That's the main thing. Then number two, though, is to inform and, and to interact with policy community on getting the kinds of information they need to preserve the things that we, we're losing. The partnership between the scientific community and the governments is, is really invaluable for moving complicated, difficult, long-term issues from the scientific into the governmental domain. And I'm optimistic that IPBES will be able to take advantage of the same kinds of partnership opportunities between the scientific community and the world's governments. One of the things that I found about Hal was that he could talk everybody's language. Even though he was a scientist, he could explain that science to the policymakers. And even though he was a scientist, he could take what the policy were makers were saying and explain that to the other scientists on the committee. So he played an instrumental role in really bridging between the science and the policy. However, very few scientists are trained in politics and policymaking. To address this challenge, the Leopold Leadership Program at Stanford University provides academic researchers with the skills and connections they need to be effective leaders and communicators. And it was Hal's idea that we have to take scientists and make sure that they are important and effective leaders in our society and we have to give them the tools to permit them to do that. The photosynthesis is a true wonder of nature. Almost all life on Earth depends on this process, in which carbon dioxide is converted to organic compounds using the energy from sunlight. Some of the research at Stanford involves efforts making plants even more efficient in this process, modifying them into so-called C4 plants that are able to more efficiently fix carbon. The challenge in, for example, production of rice is that the temperatures are predicted to increase over the areas that rice is now grown, and rice is a C3 plant. C4 plants do better at high temperatures than C3 plants. One of the ideas is to take advantage of the C4 mechanism to make rice more productive at high temperatures. And right now, uh, for example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is funding a program to try and transform rice to a C4 plant. It really would be genetic engineering in a, in a very uh, big way. The interest in ecosystem services has increased during recent years, as ecologists now know a lot more about the importance of biodiversity for the functioning of these services. Especially going into the next century as we face a lot of multiple and interacting challenges of land use change and climate change and invasive species, ecosystem services really kind of sits at the nexus of those and can help guide conservation and protection of the environment in the next century. And I think that's a, a large role to play, but it's, it's something that has the potential to, to do. With land and marine ecosystems under intense pressure from human activities, negotiators from around the world met in Nagoya, Japan, trying to shape and agree on a global strategy to protect biodiversity. Ecosystem services, I think, has captured the imagination. People talk about it as the new environmentalism. I think it's really important. And I think it's, the best is yet to come in terms of what it will provide us and the solutions that it will help us create.
心。